Historical Society and good friend David McCandry. For those of you who might not know, David just retired in October after serving as director since 1987. And I believe you're still on holding the record as the longest serving state agency director. Until that time. Until that time, that's correct. <laughs> so um, we were honored. It was, it was a wonderful era. David, of course, is um, renowned for having uh, put together the whole process that brought us the wonderful Washington State History Museum in Tacoma, among other things, other accomplishments. You may, some of you may have Dave's book. I hope that you do. And if you don't, um, we're selling it in the gift shop, and you're welcome to come in after the program today and get an autographed copy. So I think you'd be well advised to do so. It's not always that you're here, Dave, so it's an opportunity to have that go on. Um, currently, uh, Dave has retired, and in addition to your research on Cook, I believe you're working on some Tacoma city history on the renaissance that really occurred with the founding of the History Museum in that warehouse district. Dave is also has an honorary doctorate from Gonzaga University, is a well-known speaker in the Northwest and nationally, and you were additionally the president of the Lewis and Clark uh, planning, what was exactly the title of the organization? The Lewis and Clark Bicentennial Council. Bicentennial Council, and I'm sure many of you enjoyed the programs that Dave presented here and the exhibits associated with the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial in from 2003 to 2006. So Dave, today you bring um, you, one of your favorite topics forward into your new interest on um, Captain Cook. And I thank you for coming. As I said, it's a great honor to have you here. I'm not really going to go say go beeps because I'm a Washington State fan, but I'll let Dave say that instead. So thanks again, Dave, and thank you all for coming. Thanks, Sue, and uh, thanks to all of you for uh, being here today. I. Uh, um, particularly heartened to see so many uh, familiar faces, friends going back many years. Looks about just about half the room I've had an association with in uh, some form or another, whether it was Lewis and Clark or the Tumwater History Commission or state government. Um, uh, Captain Cook cruises, uh, History Museum volunteers, fellow staff members and colleagues, so it's, um, it's a delight. Um, especially for Galen here, who's actually heard this talk before and decided to come again. Uh, which um, actually is perhaps a good segue. I've done a lot of uh, public speaking through the years, and I've had my fair share of comments, and I've, I've, I've had some bad talks too, I would, I would quickly add. And there's a correlation in my, uh, uh, inevitable to the number of times you've given a talk and how good you are at it. So this is only the second time I've given this talk, and I'm not trying to lower expectations. <laughs> um, well, maybe I am trying to lower expectations, but, uh, uh, but take some heart from the fact that Galen's uh, here from Puyallup came 35, 40 miles uh, to hear a, a, another version, uh, a second version of this talk, which as Sue indicated, uh, is a direct outgrowth of my, one of my new research interests, which is um, Captain Cook which doesn't strain credulity to see how someone who has done work on Lewis and Clark would also find Captain Cook interesting, although I'm, I'm going backwards in time, which is actually, uh, just to digress a bit, and this will be a very discursive presentation, that's kind of my style. I, I was reflecting, just as I was driving in today, my research interests have always gone back in time. I started out kind of being interested in the pioneer era I, with the Catholic missionaries, Isaac Stevens. Then I kind of got interested in the Oregon Trail, fur trade, Lewis and Clark, and now I'm back to um, uh, Captain Cook. Where I might go from there is, is anyone's guess. Uh, I would just like to preface, though, the Captain Cook interest uh, because there's an organizational or an institutional context, and then I'll begin my formal uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the History Museum... Uh, is partnering with the Anchorage Museum uh, for an exhibit on Captain Cook uh, that will open uh, in Anchorage in 2015 and presumably would come to Tacoma sometime that summer or that fall. 
and there's a title for that exhibit which uh, escapes me at the moment. Uh, the particular angle uh, for that exhibit, um, and I'm on the uh, uh, curatorial team, the, inter the interpretive team, and I'm co-editing the, uh, the anthology, uh, is the fact that Cook's Third Voyage uh, is the least uh, interpreted of his, uh, of his three, particularly that time that he spent in our portion of the world, which in the kind of a Cook idiom should be thought of as the northeast quadrant of the Pacific Ocean. Cook um, falls victim, Cook studies fall victim to what I refer to as the Polynesian palm tree paradigm. Uh, a, a pretty wan attempt at alliteration there. But, it, kind of, but, it, but it, it is descriptive because people uh, are interested in Captain Cook for very understandable reasons. At least some people are interested in Captain Cook for a very readily understood and appreciated reason, which is that he spent some time in some of the most glorious spots to visit on this, uh, uh, what Meriwether Lewis called sublunary world. Uh, the globe, and I'm referring, of course, to Tahiti and Tonga, and of course Hawaii, uh, which islands uh, he discovered on uh, on his uh, third and last trip. Uh, and there are very dramatic uh, intercultural encounters that happened on that <clears throat> on those three voyages. Uh, and his time in our portion of the world gets short shrift, which um, is kind of my own little niche in historical study. I mean, what I'm drawn to is those stories that other people are seemingly ignoring or, or given less emphasis to, which is why my work on Lewis and Clark, for example, emphasized their time on the Columbia River segment because I developed the theory that a, a lot of attention, most attention, arguably too much attention, was spent to their time on the Missouri River side of the Continental Divide. So. Um, uh, so that's how I, that's, that's kind of the origin of my interest in Cook uh, and the, the instit, uh, as I say, the institutional uh, uh, connection. Um, one last prefatory comment. Uh, it's often stated uh, that history repeats itself, which is literally not true, can't possibly be true, and on the face of it is untrue. But what history does do is rhyme. And uh, rhymes are what my ear as a historian are, are, are attracted to. And it thought of as, as kind of a, um, uh, uh, a, 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 this particular talk today, the Cook connection to Lewis and Clark, is an exercise in historical rhyming, if you think of that. And I'll just kind of tease you with that observation and then, um, then get to uh, the, uh, the, the talk here in earnest. <clears throat> so one of the curious things about studying exploration um, is uh, the explorers would frequently cross-reference each other's work. Uh, that was particularly true during the age of the Enlightenment. Um, uh, the uh, voyages of worldwide discovery in the Pacific and elsewhere in the 18th century going through to the first half of the 19th century, which would have included Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark, for example, uh, very regularly make reference to the, explore, the exploratory activities of George Vancouver, who was actually a midshipman with Cook on Cook's second and third voyages, and, uh, and Cook's lieutenant, uh, William Broughton, who had surveyed the Columbia River, which of course would have been of great interest to Lewis and Clark since getting to the Columbia River and the ocean <clears throat> was the, the essence of their western mission. Uh, in my Lewis and Clark book, um, uh, I make a great deal, some his other historians and critics think I make too much of the fact that uh, Lewis and Clark were also heavily reliant upon the narrative of Alexander Mackenzie, who was a fur trading explorer, Scotsman by birth, but operating out of Montreal for the Northwest Company. Now what's interesting there is that Lewis uh, and Clark would, were, um, would quick frequently aver to what Vancouver had done, and there's a famous reference to Cook that I'm going to share here shortly, but they kept their reference and their reliance on Mackenzie hidden at all the time because it was actually Mackenzie's exploration that prompted Jefferson to send what we know as the Lewis and Clark expedition into the field in uh, 1804. 
Um, so uh, I referenced this, so let me share the, fam the most famous connection between Lewis and Clark and Cook, and it's uh, uh, Meriwether Lewis's famous uh, inscription in his journal from the 7th of April, 1805, as they were uh, going to venture out into terra incognita uh, for the first time, previously unexplored territory. Uh, he wrote, our vessels consisted of six small canoes and two large pirogues. This little fleet, although not quite so respectable as those of Columbus and Captain Cook, were still viewed by us with as much pleasure as those deservedly famed adventurers ever beheld theirs, and I dare say with quite as much anxiety for their safety and preservation. Now, in a way, what Lewis in, is engaged in here is a little bit of narrative whimsy, uh, referring to his juxtaposition uh, to Cook. Um, but it does give some insight into where Lewis's mind is, because he's clearly placing himself within an idiom of human activity, which we know as exploration, what historians refer to as the second great age of exploration, the first one being that of Columbus, the great finders of the continents, Columbus, uh, Vasco da Gama, Ferdinand Magellan, and then the second great age of discovery, which in no small measure was precipitated by the explorations of Captain Cook, which are, although not really finding continents, although one could say that uh, Cook's delineation of the east coast of Australia is kind of a quasi-continental endeavor, and he was the first one to gain intimation of the fact that there was a uh, the Antarctic continent, although we never, we don't believe, historians don't believe actually saw Antarctica, he got close enough and deduced that there had to be a big land mass uh, at, the, uh, at, the south, uh, at the South Pole. So of these two explorers that Lewis is associating with, clearly Cook is the, is the far more uh, relevant of them. And uh, as I just mentioned there in passing, it's important, I mean, it's impossible to underestimate Cook's role in the history of exploration. And if you go, if you do these famous lists of famous explorers, I actually am quite amazed that Cook isn't in that front rank on a lot of lists, but truly I think only one or two explorers, when, viewed, when, when thinking of the great span uh, of history uh, actually supersede Cook and accomplishment, and Columbus is probably that one figure for reasons that would be readily deducible by an audience such as this that pays attention to history. But one of Cook's uh, particular contests, not so much the physical labor <clears throat> and the endurance and the insight in conducting three worldwide circumnavigations, although he didn't li live to complete the third one, of course, uh, is that he created a whole manner of approach to exploration, what uh, William Getzman, who was, is now deceased, but was a, for a long time the great dean of the history of exploration, um, called the second great age of discovery. And, and scientific exploration, unlike that from the previous era of uh, Columbus uh, and, um, and uh, Magellan and the sort, included having scientists, naturalists, artists, people who had nothing to do explicitly and forthrightly with the outright imperial and mercantilist and in some measure evangelical motives that uh, spurred the first great age of discovery. So Cook created a whole new, again, paradigm of approach. Again, what was known as scientific exploration. And clearly that was the mode that people like Mackenzie, David Thompson, and indeed Lewis and Clark would also follow. Uh, not necessarily uh, just limiting oneself to the imperial or geopolitical ambitions, but a little bit more encompassing view of what the objective is, learning about new lands, new people, etc. So that is, uh, so although uh, Lewis's comment when he's leaving Fort, Ma Fort Mandan is kind of a formulaic tribute, there actually are deeper connections between the two, uh, and that's what I'd like to explore here in the, the balance uh, uh, of my talk. Um, let's start with their instructions. A great deal is made in Lewis and Clark uh, uh, stu uh, study history about Jefferson's instructions uh, to uh, Meriwether Lewis. 
And this is true of a lot of Lewis and Clark stuff, and this is kind of the light motif of my book on Lewis and Clark. People who only study Lewis and Clark come upon these things and, and they're just, they just marvel at, uh, at the brilliance, whether it's Thomas Jefferson's instructions or something Meriwether Lewis might say, without realizing that if you just simply compared those remarks with what other people who are exploring at roughly the same time, you'd find is really not that exceptional. In other words, even something like Jefferson's instructions to Meriwether Lewis fall within a model of behavior, a model of thought, and in fact there are very remarkable resonances or rhyming features to Jefferson's instructions to Meriwether Lewis that can be found in Captain Cook's instructions. For example, Jefferson told Lewis to take careful observations of latitude and longitude at all remarkable points, and that was the prime directive for Lewis. Uh, I mean, after all, the fundamental point of Lewis and Clark was that it was a map-making exercise. It was a cartographic venture. And um, that was its most salient property. In doing so, Jefferson modeled, took as a, as a model for that and other attributes, which I'll exp uh, explicate here, uh, Cook was told by the British Admiralty to carefully observe latitude and longitude and uh, with a key adjunct function known as observing the variation of the needle. Now this is, and I, I should, there actually was one other prefatory comment I wanted to make at the outset. Whereas I would feel comfortable standing before this audience or any other audience as an expert on Lewis and Clark, I consider myself a first year freshman student of Captain Cook. So, uh, uh, so uh, 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 that again is just kind of, um, uh, uh, since they're managing expectations in New Hampshire, I'm managing expectations uh, here, uh, here in Olympia. So, the ver so uh, it had been recently discovered by such people as Mercator, or Mercator, the fellow from whom that famous projection of cartography is named, that the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole seemed to shift, and science in that age was fascinated by that. So people sent out into the world, like Cook, and then later Lewis, were instructed to follow the path of where, the, where magnetic north seemed to indicate. C Cook had that instruction, Lewis had that instruction. Um, next in importance, certainly to the American directions that, uh, that, that Lewis got, if not the British ones that, were, that the Admiralty uh, uh, dispatched uh, with Captain Cook, were whatever ethnographic insights that could be gleaned by these uh, scientific explorers going out into the world. And it's important to remark here, I think, that what we know uh, as the social science of anthropology actually has a very direct, precise, and I think pinpointed point of origin in this era with Captain Cook, with people like Meriwether Lewis. That is where the, the study of the, uh, the science and the study of man actually has its roots in these exploratory ventures like Captain Cook and Meriwether Lewis. Um, the nature of man was one of the great concerns of the Age of Reason in Europe uh, and its principal intellectual outpost in North America at that time, which would have been Philadelphia, with the American Philosophical Society where Thomas Jefferson and his scientific friends uh, met from time to time. So when Cook was sent out, he was instructed to observe the genius, temper, disposition, and number of natives he encountered, and was further advised to cultivate a friendship and alliance with them, and I'm quoting now, making them presents of such trifles as they may value, inviting them to traffic. And here we get to perhaps the most obvious uh, disjunction between the first great age of exploration and the second great age of exploration, the latter being that of the era of Cook and Lewis, and it's, it's the engagement of mind and temperament between these people from Europe and Europe, Euro-American civilizations and indigenous people around the world. Uh, because in the era of Cook, Lewis, Jefferson Lewis, if I can term it that, there was this dawning awareness that not only did indigenous people around the world have, their cultures have certain autonomous values, there was kind of this 
for, for the first time that it, it had ever happened in Western civilization, thinkers in, in, in that civilization were deducing, you know, maybe these native people in the South Seas or Australia or wherever, maybe there are aspects of their lives that are actually superior to the way we're coping with things here in Europe. And now today we would know that as the principle of multiculturalism. Uh, but again, the roots of that go back to this point in time where people like Cook were having encounters like in Tahiti or Hawaii and thinking, what's wrong with this life, uh, for example? Uh, and so uh, studying this, gaining some insights into these indigenous cultures was, was an important part of the common directive to Captain Cook and to uh, Meriwether Lewis. Um, showing, unlike what Columbus did and the conquistadors in Spanish America where enslavement or just simply liquidation of native people was the order of the day, Cook was told to show native people every kind of civility and regard. Now, it must be quickly added, that is the ideal against which they did not always succeed. But nonetheless, the fact that it is the ideal is the important thing, which is why the ideals in our Declaration of Independence are the important thing, that we might as a culture never live up to those ideals, could be readily granted from any number of perspectives. But we should nevertheless take pride in the fact that that is the ideal. So this is a change in Western civilization and European civilization's outlook on the world that you see in the commissioning of people like Cook and Lewis. Similarly, Jefferson told Lewis to make yourself acquainted as far as diligent pursuit of your journey may admit with the names of the natives and their numbers. Um, and if anything, Jefferson's instructions to Lewis were more encompassing than the ones Cook had uh, because he was specifically directed to observe their occupations in agriculture, fishing, hunting, war, the arts and the implements for these, again, I'm quoting from Jefferson's instructions. And again, like Cook, Lewis was to treat natives, and I quote Jefferson, in the most friendly and conciliatory manner which their own conduct will admit, make them acquainted with the peaceable and commercial dispositions of the United States of our wish to be neighborly, friendly, and useful to them. Of course, the whole point of ventures like Cook and Lewis was to uh, discover new lands. Uh, uh, Cook was uh, specifically directed in his uh, commission to observe the nature of the soil and the products thereof, the beasts and fowls that inhabit or frequent it, and the fishes that are be found in the rivers or upon the coast, and in what plenty. I like that phraseology. Actually, I do. I am quite taken by English language phraseology of the 18th in 19th century, so much so that some people have accused me of actually talking in that idiom myself. So again, the rhyming device in Jefferson's analog, his instructions to Lewis, Lewis is told that among other objects worthy of notice will be the soil, the soil and the face of the country, its growth and vegetable production, especially those not known in the U.S. and mineral production of every kind. Now, by definition, explore, exploration in far distant lands and waters was a dangerous enterprise. And so in the case of emergency, Cook was told by the Admiralty, and I quote from his instructions, to proceed as upon the advice of your officers you shall judge most advantageous to the services on which you are employed. Jefferson told Lewis uh, to exercise discretion in regard to the danger, the degree of danger as you may risk. Both were given directions to allow for the need for succession planning. Anyone who's any, anyone who's spent any time in the life of an organization knows that succession planning is a big thing, and so it was in the era of exploration. Uh, for Cook, his instructions say, in the case of your inability by sickness or otherwise, to carry these instructions into execution, you are to careful, you are to be careful to leave them with the next officer in command who is hereby required to execute them in the best manner he can. Similarly, Lewis was instructed that by any instrument signed and written in your own hand, 
to name the person who shall succeed to the command on your decease. Now, to gain some insight into another key aspect of, uh, of this era of exploration, and to reemphasize the point that unlike a lot of exploration in the first age, that was quite demonstrably mercantile and, uh, and, and intended to develop and, 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 uh, and encourage uh, uh, growth and, and, and for economic uh, 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 gleanings, whether it's gold or founding colonies and that sort of thing. Uh, ventures like Cook's explorations in the Lewis and Clark were national endeavors and not private concerns. And that's cl clear among other, and in among other respects by the fact that both Cook and Lewis were directed at the end of their voyage to return promptly to home uh, and, uh, and, and, and to tender the, what were perceived to be the items of greatest value in their possession, which were any journals they or anyone under their command might have uh, completed. The Admiralty told Cook that at the end of his first voyage, and I quote now, he is to immediately to repair to this office in order to lay before us a full account of your proceedings in the whole course of your voyage, taking care before you leave the vessel to demand from your officers and petty officers the log books and journals they may have kept and to seal them up for our inspection. And then, um, Concomitantly, Lewis told Jefferson that upon re-entering the United States, you are using almost the same language. This is where I talk about history rhyming. Repair yourself with papers to the seat of government. Uh, now what this offers an insight into is the, the whole world of unauthorized accounts uh, by junior members of both expeditions, which was uh, a problem endemic to Cook's career somewhat mortifyingly, and of course Lewis himself in probably the most, the least, the most unseemly episode in his post-expeditionary career is when he got into a big hassle with a publisher uh, who wanted to publish Patrick Gass's uh, journal, uh, uh, again, an, an, an unauthorized account. And so it's, in, it's within these contexts that things like that sprung up. Before we leave Jefferson, and it's really almost a Jefferson and Cook connection that I've been regaling you with here as much as it is a uh, 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 Cook and, uh, and Lewis connection. Um, uh, and it's worth noting that Jefferson and Cook were actually contemporaries. Um, Cook was obviously much older. Well, he died even before Lewis went in the field, but Cook was born uh, many decades before Lewis was. But there's another Cook Jefferson connection that I'm fascinated with, a handful of historians and have delved into, and that's the figure by the name of John Ledger, who's one of the who's one of the most fascinating people in all the history of exploration. Ledger was an American assigned to the Corps of Marines on Cook's third voyage. Actually, the fellow who brought Cook's third voyage, Cook's command home. Lieutenant Gore on the third voyage after Cook was killed in Hawaii was also an American, which kind of creates an interesting subtext to a lot of what Cook has to say, because Cook's out in the ocean while what we know as the American Revolution is first originating and then plays out. There's, there's a whole American Revolution to Cook's story we don't have time to get into today. But Ledger's an, an, an interesting subtext, and he's one of these fellows that published an unauthorized version of Cook's voyage uh, in 1783, but he beat Cook, or the editor of Cook's third voyage, uh, into print. Now, what, what's interesting about Ledger, um, uh, among other things, is uh, the history of copyright protection, intellectual property rights, in our culture, in American culture, actually have their roots in Ledger's unauthorized account. What's ironic here is Ledger stole much of what he wrote, but was, was very quick to claim that he owned the copyright value because he didn't want unauthorized accounts of his unauthorized <laughs> account. And so the very first copyright laws in the United States, I see that some uh, attorney like Charlie back there and Tim, th this might have more enduring interest for uh, you practitioners. 
uh, before the bar, but uh, so the origin of copyright law in the United States has its roots in Captain Cook and exploration more generally. Um, uh, Ledger was given one particular assignment by Captain Cook uh, and kind of comes to the fore of the Cook story in a prominent fashion when they're up in uh, uh, the, what we would know as Alaska waters and, they, and Cook and his fo fellows get um, the, the sense that the Russian fur traders have moved in and, and Cook's, this is the first time in three voyages in the Pacific the Cook and his, one of, somebody in his expedition has encountered someone of Euro-American Euro, uh, extraction. So Ledger is given the assignment to go out and, and, and find out more about the Russians and what they can tell about the geography of the Arctic, uh, given Cook's particular interest, of course, in finding the Northwest Passage, which I now realize I overlooked in my opening remarks. That's what Cook is up here for. He's looking for the same thing Columbus was looking for, a quick way of getting from Europe to Asia without having to deal with the complication of this landmass that we know as the Western Hemisphere of the New World. Um, so that's what, that, so that's what uh, Cook is up there for. But um, uh, Ledger, um, as, as the story goes on, uh, runs into Thomas Jefferson in the 1780s when Jefferson is now over in Europe as the American minister to France. This is, the, this is before the, uh, the Constitution. And he starts telling Jefferson, and we know about this largely from Jefferson's account, rather than from anything Ledger himself wrote. Uh, Ledger comes up with the idea that he wants to walk around the world. <laughs> he's going to single-handedly, well, actually, he's going to take two dogs with him. And anyone who's read my book with, about Lewis and Clark knows that I have a lot to say in there about, uh, about Lewis's dog. But, um, and this, this is what I mean when I, uh, now this is where my freshman status of a student of Cook comes in, because uh, I want to know more about Ledger. But uh, I'm thinking that uh, the fact that this American, Ledger, shows up in Paris in the 1780s looking to kind of clear the path for a, for, a, for a solo walk around the world, that had to have had a profound effect on Thomas Jefferson, the romantic side of Thomas Jefferson. And I believe, uh, uh, if nothing else, it kind of stirred the fire already, perhaps in Jefferson's bosom, about exploration and learning more about the world. And so there, in an odd sort of way, is, is another Cook uh, and Lewis and Clark connection. And by the way, Ledger's premise that it was even possible for a single person to travel uh, around the world in the Northern Hemisphere came, was gleaned with his voyage with Cook, where he discovered, as did Cook, just how close Asia and North America come to each other up at the Bering Strait, which I've never been to myself. That's one of my goals in this phase of my life is maybe to get up there. I subscribed to Francis Parkman's great axiom. Parkman was the first great American historian who said, if you want to understand history, you have to go to where it happened to understand it. So that might get me eventually down to Tierra del Fuego or the Arctic Ocean. We'll see. But Ledger saw how close the continents came together. I think that was the seed point of his idea. And actually, it was Ledger who told Jefferson uh, uh, what we would all perhaps conceive of as an axiomatic piece of anthropological understanding, which is that the natives inhabiting Alaska looked an awful lot like the people they also saw over in Kamchatka and on the Asian side, and that the North America was populated by people who had crossed over from, from uh, the Bering Strait. So even this mega idea in the, in, 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 in the uh, the anthro and our anthropological understanding also has its kind of root here in this, um, this seed time. Well, let, let me move on beyond that to a couple other themes. Um, for example, the notion of the explorer as a paragon of asceticism. <laughs> I'm not even sure I know what asceticism <laughs> means. I think I know what an ascetic, an ascetic is somebody who denies themselves a lot of the pleasures of life. Um, and of course, one of the, one reason Cook is so famous in the literature of Western civilization 
is the famous, or depending upon one's perspective, the infamous sexual liberality he and people on his crew met with native women in Polynesia, which created a scandal, a sensation. It was, needless to say, much remarked upon. But also, more to the point, and I'm not going to go off there for, for obvious reasons, um, is that Cook went out of his way in his journal to deny himself that part of the, the uh, Polynesian experience or European travelers. That's what I mean by uh, the explorer as the ascetic hero. In fact, he took particular pride in relating one account where uh, a, a, a young Polynesian woman is offered to cook and he goes out of his way to, um, uh, to turn down uh, the offer and, he, and he, Cook in his own journal reports that another woman there with the, uh, there in Polynesia uh, kind of takes Cook the task, Cook, quoting Cook in his own journal on this, what sort of man are you thus to refuse the embraces of so fine a young woman? Well, my point, is, which is not to dwell on that, is, is really the larger one, the theme for why we're here, which is, again, one of the things that rhymes about this, one thing oft remarked about, oft studied with Lewis and Clark, is how there were similar sexual encounters during the, the Lewis and Clark expedition, but Lewis and Clark seem to have been particularly ascetic in their, in their comportment relative to that issue. Now, some people naively conclude, well, that's, that was just simply their moral upbringing, uh, but in fact, um, I think it's both deeper than that and shallower than that. That, is what an ex that kind of deportment is what an explorer in the age of Cook was expected to do because Cook had gone so out of his way to popularize his own, uh, again, deportment, which is a, kind of a funny, almost antiquarian world, word. Now, I remember it from my parochial school report card, attendance, deportment. Uh, <laughs> Anyone else remember deportment from their parochial school? There we go. Uh, anyway, I, I digress. Um, Cook took such pains to popularize his asceticism that it became de rigueur among explorers to deny themselves uh, 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 indulgences like that. And for a reason that if one thinks about it uh, at all is, is perhaps readily deducible which is Cook didn't want to do anything that would compromise his authority with the crew, the men entirely in this case, that he was commanding. He didn't want to do anything that would compromise his position because he frequently had to put a stop to all of that cavorting. And if he himself was engaging in it, that would compromise his authority. So that was the very practical uh, rationale for it and probably goes a long way to explaining why there's no record in the Lewis and Clark journals of the, of, of the captains engaging uh, in encounters of a sexual kind with native women uh, during uh, their trip. At this point, I'd like to shift kind of gears and go to kind of another theme, which is um, a kind of the narrative construction of exploratory accounts. And my favorite word, it's kind of a fancy word, and the students of literature use it. It's the notion of a trope. A trope is kind of a, con is a, kind of a convention. It's kind of a standard way of, uh, of, of describing situations. So um, one of them is the leadership trope. This is, a, this is a narrative device that shows up routinely in exploratory accounts. For example, um, the most famous one in Lewis and Clark, uh, the Lewis and Clark idiom, is the famous episode at the decision point at the Marias, where they don't, the, the captains don't know which fork of the river is the main fork. Is it the northern fork, what we know as the Marias, is that it, or is it this fork that goes off to the west and southwest, which of course is the main fork, that would take them to uh, the Great Falls and then on to a connection with the Columbia River. So this was a major decision point. Uh, the essence of which was all of the men in the Lewis and Clark expedition thought the northern fork, i.e. the Marias, was the way they should go, but the captains 
were bound and determined to lead them correctly, as it turns out, up the main fork that goes to the south and the west. But this, kind of, this creates kind of a, lead, a test of le a leadership moment in any, ch in any command structure, as would be readily uh, evident. All the men want to go one way, but the leaders want to go another. And so famously, he kind of described as summing up this whole story in his, in his journal, Lewis exercises the leadership trope as a narrative device in his journal when he said, after explaining all of this, um, uh, I endeavored to impress on the minds of the party, all of whom except Captain Clark, being still firm on the belief that the North Fork was the Missouri and that, we, that which we ought to take, Nonetheless, they said very cheerfully that they were ready to follow us anywhere we thought proper and direct. And this is one of those lines in the journals of Lewis and Clark a lot of people have fussed about uh, during the years uh, about the, the leadership command, the style, and the ability of Lewis and Clark as commanders. Except when you read many accounts of exploration, you see this is just simply a throwaway line. It's almost a cliché. It shows up in all exploratory accounts, um, including uh, Captain Cook, uh, who uh, uh, several decades earlier in his, uh, in his journal is re uh, where a point where, at a point where he wants to go someplace, but the officers and the, and the midshipmen want to do something else. Um, he said, my people were yet healthy and would cheerfully have gone wherever I thought proper to lead them. So that's one instance of a narrative trope. Let's take <clears throat> strange encounters with, with animals as a narrative trope. Now Cook had, a, a, his favorite one seems to have been something that happened down at Tierra del Fuego. He had almost a peaceable kingdom type moment. You're all familiar with that allegorical painting. Probably many of you know it better than I do, and I'm up here talking about it. But anyway, Cook, reflecting on the behavioral pattern of a host of sea lions and penguins and other birds, wrote the following. It is wonderful to see how the different animals which inhabit this little spot are reconciled to each other. They seem to have entered into a league not to disturb each other's tranquility. We have seen all these animals mixed together like domesticated cattle and poultry in a farmyard without the one attempting to disturb or molest the other. Now Meriwether Lewis had his own kind of curious adventure when it came to animals that rhymes a little bit again with what I've just shared with Cook. And that happened at the Great Falls of the Missouri where seemingly most of the most important things in involving Meriwether Lewis seem to have happened. Uh, on one of his excursions, this would have been June of 1805, uh, Lewis, uh, you read his narrative, and although he in fact may have been entirely alone today, so I'm going to need a glass of water or something like that. One thing I've realized since I've retired is I'm not, I don't talk as much, and so I lose my voice a lot quicker than I used to. So Lewis, he's on one of his traipses around the countryside. He, shooting at bison. He gets surprised by a grizzly bear that chases him into the river. He sees this strange tiger cat that's kind of stalking them, uh, stalking him. And then, um, th then three bison bulls uh, come charging at Lewis, which forced him to conclude, uh, thank you. One should be fine. Oh, there, spare. So he concludes from all of this in language, again, that seems to my reading rhymes a little bit with Cook's story, that the, uh, all of the beasts of this neighborhood have made a league to destroy me, or that made, <laughs> made, uh, some fortune was disposed to amuse herself at my expense. And it wasn't so, now those are actually different experiences, but what I think is, what I find interesting, again, the rhyming nature and the reliance of explorers on one another. Cook talks about the animals being in a league. So here is Lewis, his great moment with the, natural, with the encounter with the animal kingdom. And again, he uses the same typology, semantical phraseology to describe his encounter. <clears throat> so that's the second trope. The third uh, is the trope of inexpressibility. Now the notion here was that it was expected of an explorer in the age of the Enlightenment 
which include, which would include kind of an elaborate journal or published account, that is to say a narrative description of what happened. I mean, there was no published account of Columbus. There is no such thing. The journals of, of Cook himself, if, in their published version, have stood on their side to come up to my hip. So that's the difference between these ages. So uh, in terms of the, the, the narrative content. Um, in Enlightenment era exploration, it was expected in order to tell a good story in no small measure that there would be very dramatic crescendos in the account. <clears throat> uh, and um, um, Lewis had his moments of inexpressibility again at the Great Falls. Um, in the Moulton edition of the Lewis and Clark journals when, it, when Lewis is talking about this picturesque countryside and the sublime landscape and all of that, that description runs five pages of, of typed, um, typed verbiage. A few passages will give us the tenor if you're not all familiar with it. Lewis talks about the water in its passage down breaks into a perfect white foam which assumes a thousand forms in a moment sometimes flying up in jets of sparkling foam. From the reflection of the sun on the spray or mist which arises from these falls, there is a beautiful rainbow produced which adds not a little beauty to this majestically grand scenery. In revising his text, Lewis later writes that he became so disgusted with the description I just provided you, which seems to me to be clearly sufficient. I mean, it just holds interest. But anyway, Lewis became so disgusted, and here's where I'm getting to the point, with the imperfect idea which it conveyed that I determined to draw my pen across it and begin again. I wished for the pencil of Salvatore Rosa or the pen of Thompson that I might be able to give to the enlightened world some just idea of this truly magnificent and sublimely grand object, which of course was the Great Falls of the Missouri. So however, style, however fashionable, stylistic, and attractive uh, Lewis's descriptive power is, it, that which is hallowed, trust me, in Lewis and Clark's studies, it was in fact a literary tactic bordering on a cliché. Inevitably, he would have had to have written something like that somewhere on the trip. It just happened to be the Great Falls of the Missouri. And um, in fact, I'd go so far as to say that, that this became a customary moment in any published narrative because Cook was having moments like this all the time. And since Cook was the great explorer, any subsequent explorer worth their salt had to have Cook-like moments and so, just to give you one example among many, one that's of particular interest uh, given our research with the exhibit, um, I refer to the great navigator's engagement with icebergs in the high southern latitudes of the Indian Ocean. After describing their size and impediment to navigation, Cook recorded the following. Great as these dangers are, um, they are now so become familiar to us that the apprehensions they cause are never of long duration and are in some measure compensated by the very curious and romantic views many of these islands, meaning icebergs, exhibit and which are greatly heightened by the foaming and dashing of the waves against them and into several holes and caverns which are formed in most of them. In short, the whole exhibits a view which can be easily described by the pencil of an able painter, and at once fills the mind with admiration and horror, the first is occasioned by the beautifulness of the picture and the latter by the danger attending it, uh, for it was a ship to fall aboard one of these large pieces of ice, she would be dashed to pieces in a moment. So not only the inability to express it, but right up to the trope within the trope of a, how does he fra phrase it, the pencil of an able painter is how Cook phrased it. And what did Lewis say? The pencil of Salvatore Rosa. Again, here is where history I see as rhyming. Um, 
Words could fail Cook in even more dramatic moments, um, uh, such as his, his encounter with animal life. Uh, he later talked about this very imperfect account is written more with a view to assist my own memory than to give information to others. I am neither a botanist nor a naturalist and have not words to describe the productions of nature either in one science or the other. Well, I see the time is getting late. We need to move on. So I'm going to skip through a lot of this and get right to the end, perhaps even allowing uh, some uh, uh, moment or a few moments for uh, questions. Um, so let me get to um, uh, these concluding remarks. Um, uh, and I, perhaps I have a chance to write this all up and you can read the fuller treatment someday. Or either that or I'll give this talk so many times eventually I'll get better at it and be able to cover all the material. Um, but there's one, uh, uh, this that me perhaps I'll read just to get through it on a timely basis. Oddly and in conclusion there is one last piece of the lives of Cook and Lewis that is symmetrical. As the historian of exploration Felipe Fernandez Armesto put it, for some explorers the best career move was death. <laughs> <laughs> this, this thesis more largely put suggests that premature death masks failure and becomes a perverse kind of success. But whereas Lewis died under cloudy circumstances that are still debated today, Cook's demise was one of the most dramatic and vividly recounted of any such episode in history, having been witnessed by hundreds, if not thousands. Even so, once again, the trope of inexpressibility comes to the fore. Look, Lieutenant King, the principal chronicler of Cook's burial at sea, put it this way, the bones having been put into a coffin, and the service read over them. They were committed to the deep with the usual military honors. What our feelings were on this occasion, I believe the world to conceive, those who were present know that it is not within my power to express them. Cook's death was one of the great shocks in the modern history of the world. For those alive today, only the assassination of John Kennedy provides a hint to the event's visceral impact. Cook, like JFK, was an international figure and an accomplished one. The horror at the news of his death stunned Enlightenment-era culture. Indeed, Cook, in an ironic twist given the scholarly debate over the nature of Hawaiian obeisance on his first appearance in the islands, was memorialized in a famous drawing, The Apotheosis of Cook, Cook going off to heaven. In, a, in prose, a contemporary referred to Cook's tragic demise in Hawaii as a great loss to the universe. The greatest praise for Cook came from his colleague of discovery on the first voyage, Joseph Banks. The great naturalist, in a memorable turn of phrase, said Cook's paternal courage was undaunted. This wording can hardly pass notice of any modern day student of American history even less people interested in the Lewis and Clark story. In his wildly popular history of the expedition titled Undaunted Courage, Stephen, Ambrose's, Stephen Ambrose adapted Thomas Jefferson's testimonial in memory of Lewis, found as a preface in the first edition of the Lewis and Clark journals published in 1814. Jefferson, one imagines, seems to have been inspired by Banks' tribute to Cook, when he wrote of Lewis's courage undaunted, possessing a firmness and perseverance of purpose. Thus, in that respect, from both the formulation of the guiding principles of their respective missions to the premature ends of their memorable lines, lives, even to the testimonies rendered by their closest contemporaries, Cook and Lewis connections, each to the other, each to the other runs strong. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>